Okay, welcome. <clears throat> We're really pleased to have you here. Um, this event is uh, co-sponsored by the en Environmental Studies Program, the Community Health Program, and the International Relations. I think that one thing that you can say about this topic is that it has connections to the environment, it's global, and it's got a, a strong community health perspective. So we're really glad that we can bring this conversation to you. Um, we're thankful for financial support from the provost's office. Without it, we couldn't have brought um, Dr. Um, Pickett over the ocean, and, and also for the, the art deans of arts and sciences. You know, we're getting to the point where we're trying to feed about 9 billion people, and we're sort of challenged with trying to figure out how we're going to produce so much food, while also providing farmers kind of a, a, a security that, it, that many don't currently have today. Uh, farmers, it, farming is really hard, it's really risky business, and it's ever-changing. So, so farmers have a lot on their plates, and I think today's uh, conversation and presentation will sort of talk about some of those challenges farmers face. Um, today's speaker is uh, Dr. John Pickett, and today's interviewer is uh, Timothy Griffin from our Agriculture, Food, and the Environment program down at the School of Nutrition. But, and they've spent their career sort of imagining what a sustainable agricultural system will look like. So I think we're going to have a really interesting conversation with them. But before I introduce them, I want to just sort of, sort of lay out sort of what we had imagined tonight would look like. Um, Dr. Pickett will be speaking to us for about 45, 50 minutes. And then uh, Dr. Griffin will be asking some questions. And we know that we have some people who are watching online. So we're, they're going to be typing in questions. And so we've left some sort of cards here where you could write your own questions. And then we would get them to Dr. Griffin and he could answer them. And um, we will decide at, that at some point in time if it actually makes more sense just to have people raise their hands. But that was the format that we had imagined for today. OK. So um, we, we encourage you to, to um, if you do want to type in, uh, you can use uh, environmental studies at tufts.edu to type in your question. OK, so it's really my pleasure to introduce both the interviewer and the speaker. And I'll start with the, the interviewer. Tim Griffin is a internationally recognized professor in the Friedman School of Nutrition, where he directs the school's agriculture, food, and the environment program. Over the course of his career, he's worked with vegetable farmers, with dairy farmers. He's developed uh, sustainability research programs and participated in a lot of national uh, study committees. His research focuses on regional food systems, nutrient cycling, and sustainable agriculture. He was a special sustainability advisor to the dietary guidelines for the American committee that just released their report a few weeks ago. Some of you may be aware of it. And of relevance to today's topic, he is a member of the National Research Council's Study Committee on Genetically Engineered Crop, Past Experience, and Future Prospects. We're so pleased that he agreed to be an interviewer for this discussion. Dr. John Pickett come to us from the prestigious Rothamsted Research Institution in the UK, where he explores new, new ways to exploit uh, natural pest resistance mechanisms. He really is a scientist, and it's just wonderful to sort of, I've been experiencing his energy and enthusiasm for the kind of science that he does, and I think he's going to share that enthusiasm. One thing you need to remember as, you're, as you head into this talk, plants can't hide and run away. So they're stuck in one place. And so figuring out how to protect our plants is a major challenge in an agricultural system, which is inherently not a particularly natural system. Um, in natural systems, plants rely on chemical defenses to protect themselves. And Dr. Pickett's research is really geared towards understanding some of these natural plant defenses and adopting them for the use in our own food systems. And he's very open to considering both sort of traditional, sort of new ways of doing that protection, but also incorporating genetically modified. He's published over 460 papers. He's a distinguished professor in the UK and also a foreign associate of the National Academy of Sciences here in the United States. He's currently president of the Royal Entomological Society and is an advisor to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We are so fortunate that he agreed to come here and present tonight. Let's welcome him to Tufts. Uh, as the chair beautifully put it, I, I'm very interested in new science and new technologies, but I'm also very interested in developing more classical approaches and in learning from those approaches. And I'm uh, both pleased to be working in Africa and doing some good, I think, uh, because it's 
not only an opportunity to do that, but it's also an opportunity to learn from how you can exploit natural systems in a sustainable way, thereby to perhaps hone what we need to do to make our own agriculture and food production more sustainable uh, in the future. So uh, I'm going to use the, the mouse so that the streaming can, um, uh, can see it. Here we go. Yeah, so we have various funding agencies here. That's the European Union. And then the collaboration in Africa is with the International Centre uh, of Insect Physiology and Ecology. Uh, Rothamsted is funded by the British Biotechnology and Biological Sciences Research Council. And as you gather then, we're called Rothamsted. Whoops. And we've been there for a long time. Since 1843, we've been running experiments on plant nutrition. And um, we've, we've jumped into my first slide, but we'll carry on uh, with that. Because what it refers to is my very good colleague and friend, Wilf Powell, and his great romance with conservation biological control. This is biological control where you use natural populations of beneficial organisms to allow you to control your pests. It's actually very difficult to do. Um, it's very difficult to manipulate populations of beneficial insects so they will come and do what you want them to do. And so I've been trying with people like Wilf and colleagues in Africa to provide tools by which to exploit conservation biological control. What we're doing there, in fact, is we're attracting parasitic wasps, which are predators on parasitoids of aphids, using the aphid sex pheromone components. That's the uh, abbreviated nepetalactone and nepetalactol. And it works, but if you tried to do that uh, by spraying it onto the crop, it wouldn't work very well. It doesn't work very well. We know that. Uh, the pheromone chemicals are very short-lived on the crop, uh, and they're extremely expensive to make. When we first identified these chemicals as the aphid sex pheromone components, we were collaborating with various major multinational companies, and they said, you know, synthesis is not a problem. We're going to be able to make you as much as you like. You can do any experiments you want to. We will cover the cost and the, the industry of making the compounds. And, uh, you know, when we said, well, if, if we go for 100 grams, how, oh, easy, no problem. You know, so six months later than the deadline, you know, we got one gram. And that was no criticism of them. It's very awkward to make some of these small molecules uh, in pure form enough and uh, formulating them so that they will stand, withstand what you want to do in the field. So, releasing such chemicals by plants that are intercropped with the crop that you want to protect, you can actually bring in the parasitoids if you've got the intercrop producing the right chemistry. So with this uh, plant, Melanis minutiflora, uh, or molasses grass because of its smell to human beings, as an intercrop, only sparsely uh, intercropped in fact, um, as you can see, we can raise the level of parasitism of stem borer moth uh, larvae uh, that are the pest of subsistence cereal production in sub-Saharan Africa, particularly in smallholder uh, farming systems. Uh, these are just two regions of Africa. This is a, a very low grain yielding region. The one before was a higher grain yielding region, so typically you if you're lucky to get a tonne per hectare equivalent in the uh, Beta Point region. So we've got an effect now by delivering the chemistry through the plant. Uh, and of course, this involves the labour of the companion cropping approach. So for the north, we have to think of alternatives to that. So in 1984, uh, and um, Sheldon, who's here, remarked that I was the only author of this paper. That's be partly because nobody else would join me. Uh, uh, and when I gave the paper from which this paper was, um, was, was made, um, uh, a distinguished plant biologist in the UK, Harold Woolhouse, said to me, yeah, John, it's a great idea, but you're at least 10 years ahead of your time. And you can see that, in fact, he, and he was optimistic because it was actually formally 21 years before we could do this in even a model plant. And we've just completed some field trials, uh, but we only have this review publication uh, available at the moment. And until we have the full field trial work accepted for publication, I can't, in fact, talk about it. Though I did hope when um, 
you invited me that I would be able to unveil the results here. But anyway, there is the field trial there, and I'll talk about it in a, in a moment, but not the exact results. And it's against aphids, and it uses GM technology to create a transgenic wheat plant that expresses the aphid alarm pheromone. That's what the aphid alarm pheromone is. Chemically, it's a sesquiterpene hydrocarbon, three sets of five carbon units. I'll leave you to count those up. And when the aphid's attacked, it tries to defend itself by producing a sticky secretion from the cornicle, the little tube where you can see that secretion. I don't think I need to point it out. It's fairly obvious. It's in the, the jaws of that chrysopid larva. And in all honesty, it's going to have very little effect on such a big predator. With a parasitoid, it could give a, a problem. But the second line of activity is that it releases a very, very small amount of this volatile compound, E-beta-phanazine. And all the other aphids, which are, of course, clonal, they're produced by parthenogenic reproduction of, of, a, of the mother aphid that started the colony, they, they, they run away. And, and in fact, uh, I, I said the other day, and I'll say it to you, that I in Japan there's a wonderfully um, fit aphid which actually stands up and fights when it gets the, the smell of the alarm pheromone. But our pest aphids, that's in Europe and here, they, they, they more mundanely jump off the plant. But that does allow them to survive some elements of parasitism. Now, plants can kind of imitate this, but not generally. Although e beta is produced by many, many plants. In fact, uh, um, I used to have a bit of a problem travelling to the US, which was nothing to do with the academic and scientific um, situation here because that is absolutely wonderful and I'm particularly enjoying this this visit to Tufts here but it was the beer but now you've got micro breweries then you've got some hops in there and the e-beta farnazine is in the beer and it, it doesn't suffer by that but the aphids will respond to e-beta farnazine formed by plants if it's released in an appropriate way and this Solanum betholtii uh, has these folia trichomes that do that in imitation of the way that the aphid is doing in that picture there from the cornical droplet. Now, you can't use plant e beta normally, but there are some essential oils that produce the e beta sufficiently away from certain other compounds, which I'll elaborate on in a minute, for it to actually do this alarm effect. And some of the compounds protect this very delicate molecule that e-beta-phanazine represents. It's very, very unstable, it's volatile, and it oxidizes like that. I s send it to labs that perhaps don't know this, and they say, oh, it didn't do anything, and that's because they opened the bottle. Um, in fact, we don't even send it in bottles, we send it in glass sealed ampules under nitrogen. And once you crack it open, it polymerizes to this sort of gum, which doesn't do anything. But there, you've got a statistically significant effect with my friend Toby Bruce at Rothamsted doing a field trial using this Hemizygia petulata uh, essential oil which has got E-beta-phanas in it, looked after in terms of natural antioxidants and presented a sufficiently pure amount from these other agents which might stop it working. And here one of them is caryophylline down at the bottom of the slide. It's very easily formed in the biosynthetic route that creates E-beta-phanazine from phanesyl pyrophosphate or phanesyl diphosphate, which is in, in as all. That's the precursor for this. Um, and if that caryophylline is there, and one or two other sesquiterpene hydrocarbons, then the aphid detects that and says to itself uh, in an anthropomorphic way, uh, ah, this, uh, this is not an aphid-produced uh, ebidophanazine. It's from a plant, and the plant's trying to fool me. I'm not going to be fooled. And there are particular olfactory neurons in the antenna on the fifth segment, um, which has this primary rhinarium thing, which is a cup-shaped thing, and in that inside there, there are the coverings uh, of the external extension of the olfactory neurons that respond to e beta farnas. And you can record from them using tungsten electrodes, which are a lot sharper at the end than they look here. Uh, but just to show you the full story, I'll go to a ladybird, because ladybirds predate aphids, and so they're also interested in the e beta farnesine. And that's where my friend Wolf Power comes in, because we could use this e beta farnesine not just to frighten aphids, but to bring in the parasitoids earlier than they would normally come in, therefore satisfying 
Wilf's idea for uh, conservation biology. But you can see that there are two cells being recorded from here, one from E beta farnesine, the top one, this high amplitude cell, and then typically a lower amplitude cell, but co-located on the antenna of the ladybird, which responds to caryophylline. And when they two fire, the caryophylline stops the ladybird looking for aphids. It, it knows it's only a plant pulling a fast one or not. So it took us then, um, in spite of the, the realistic... Um, uh, pessimism of, of Harold Woolhouse, actually 21 years to publish uh, that we could do this in Arabidopsis because we had to do some genetic engineering to get a gene that would produce very, very pure E beta farnesine. And that we've done, peak one is actually the caryophylline, it's in wild type Arabidopsis, and we've sequestered the starting material with our E beta farnesine synthase. Um, synthetically created from a sequence that we'd engineered having got it originally from, uh, from spearmint. And now we're ready then to frighten aphids and, uh, and attract parasitic wasps, which we did in that paper. Uh, and that allowed us to get a grant from the BBSRC then to do it in wheat. Now with GM, you don't need to go back into ancestors and, and non-agronomically useful um, uh, varieties, you can go straight into the elite variety. So in Europe we have a list of elite wheat varieties, they change on a yearly basis as we get better wheats with higher yielding potential. And we use cadenza, which can be sown in the spring or sown in the autumn, so it's a winter or a, a summer. And we again had synthetic genes, we had the E beta farnesine synthase with the sequence we had before, but now with code op optimization for it being expressed in a grass, in a monocot, uh, with a particular uh, promoter sequence that would also work there. And we had the option of having there also farnesyl diphosphate synthase. Now we found that if we were trying to use a plant one, the plant expressing this would recognise it and would silence it. So we chose a sequence from a different kingdom. We worked a bit on human and, uh, and chicken uh, farnesyl diphosphate synthases. In the end we used a cow sequence. But don't forget, these are synthetic now, and they look just like any plant gene, any monocot gene, otherwise they wouldn't work. And it didn't work. And so we got crosses there for both of those. But when we took a tip from the literature, particularly Marcel Dicker's group, uh, Iris Kappa's first author from Wageningen, to express this in the plastid, then we got it, even without the precursor. So e beta farnesine synthase on its own gave us a low but very clean titer of farnesine, and then we got more farnesine when we racked up the farnesyl diphosphate production, but we had to do it all in the plastid. And if you know biochemistry of the isoprenoid rule, you'll know that the plastidial pathway does not make sesquiterpenes, but we, it, we found that it does actually have a flux which involves production of the farnesyl diphosphate. So then we have now the cadenza, wild type, with not E beta farnesine in it, and now we have the cadenza GM with just the expression of the farnesine um, synthase producing a nice titer, and we can get a bigger peak uh, then with the, uh, uh, with the dif uh, farnesyl diphosphate synthase gene in as well. And there's no other phenotype, and we've done a lot and lot of work to show if anything else happens. There's a small production in some of the lines with the single construct of myrcene, which is the lower homologue. But we, it's not predicted, but on the other hand, we found it very quickly because we were looking to see what else was, was happening there. Um, now, the fact that there's, there's, there's no phenotype is, is, very, is very valuable because it means you can then go straight out into the field with the experiment. So as soon as that's done, uh, you've got to get registration, and to do that you need to demonstrate that it does something in the lab, as well as working out how not to contaminate the environment with whatever you're going to put in the, in the field. So that's now the volatiles from the GM line uh, against the spring aphid, Cytobia novini, and an autumn aphid, Rapalocytum pedi, which is mainly responsible for barley yellow dwarf virus transmission uh, to, to wheat in the UK. This is an interesting slide because it actually is a time sequence uh, experiment, but it shows that the pure E beta farnesine that we make in the lab isn't actually as good as the volatiles from the GM plant. There's some synergy that we've chanced upon, which we've not quite sorted out yet. And now the other way around then with the wasps, 
a number of wasps, but particularly Aphidius ervi, and you can see the Aphidius ervi laying its egg in the aphid. That's what it does. And the egg hatches and um, eats the aphid from the inside out. Just before it finishes it off, it pops its head out and glues the body onto the underside of the leaf, and then it forms a pupa and a cocoon on the inside. It looks like a pharaonic mummy. In fact, Wilf Powell and his colleagues, they call it um, aphid mummies, and that's what we count when we look at aphid parasitism. So by 2012, we'd done all this, and we're rather pleased with ourselves, but we had to then have the real test of what does it do in the field. And that's the bit I can't give you the details of, but there's some interesting aspects to that. First of all, we have to get permission. Now, um, just like the, um, the Environmental Protection Agency here, we have an organisation which looks at evidence for why you want to do the experiment and what you've actually got and how you can, as far as possible, lower the risk to an acceptable level of what might happen if something goes wrong. Uh, and so Lord Henley, who is a chair for this committee of experts and people who might be more concerned with not whether you're going to control aphids, but whether you're going to damage the environment and people who will be concerned with human health. They all sit there on this committee and they discuss what is being offered uh, to satisfy whatever criticism is. For example, uh, at the point when we were just getting registration, the European Union, um, and I often say to people that the legislators in the European Union would be better to go home and retire now and we would just copy what you do in the States. It might have a few warts, as they say, but it's certainly better than what we do in Europe. But anyway, they don't really agree with this, um, though perhaps if they were retired, we, we, we wouldn't even notice, let alone whether they would be better or not. But the fact is that um, they had passed a rule which said that if GM pollen got into honey, honey then it would have to be labelled as GM honey. Now, honey shouldn't really contain pollen, it can contain pollen, and it's not a problem, but it's not really intended by the bees that it will be in there, uh, and it's not really intended by the beekeepers and the people who sell honey. And we're not insect pollinated, and bees are in no way interested in flowering um, wheat, but they might be interested in the odd weed with a flower on it. So we agreed that we would put sentinel hives all around, and we, I can tell you the results there, we got no pollen in there at all, except for a very small amount of, uh, of, of wheat pollen, which seemed to have come in from uh, uh, somewhere else, because uh, we can tell the, the variety and everything. Um, but there was no GM pollen in there, as we expected, but we did it, and we did it twice, and we did it, really, to satisfy people's concern where we could do so, even though we were convinced that it wouldn't be there, and in fact the committee also didn't think it would be there. But we did it because we want to kind of be helpful in terms of worrying people. There are a lot of beekeepers in the air, and they're nice people, and they, they make a few bob out of selling, selling honey, and sometimes they give us some honey. So without being conflicted, we were able to uh, uh, allay their, their fears in that particular case. And we did many, many things like that to try and engage more positively with people who were worried about this. And we had one or two other things to contend with. We had to put a big fence around the field because we're, we're not allowed to let people go in there and take bits out. And of course the fence would stop people going in there easily anyway to destroy the crop. And there were quite a lot of people initially who said that's what they wanted to do. We also put a ditch around the field so that a truck couldn't be driven through and knock the fence down. And it filled with water and we very carefully made sure that all the people who might come and try and get in knew that it was full of water and it was deep. So we didn't want any protesters who sadly lost their life as a consequence of protesting semi-peacefully. Yeah, now, now alligators would be something. In fact, um, that's not totally a joke because that we also... <laughs> we all we also had a lot of people who wanted to defend the right to do experiments and cited Galileo and so on, who wasn't given the right um, to at least write up his experiments, uh, except when Paul Elsevier took his book up to the Netherlands and published it. Um, uh, but nonetheless, we engaged with the public, me personally on the major media, initially being shouted down, and you can see I'm not a guy who really is easily shouted down, but I've been on the course, so I know how to be shouted down. And, uh, and I was on primetime television 
But as we engaged more and more, the mass opposition to this fell away by people saying, well, you know, we do need to know what goes on if we don't know, you know, if we don't try, we'll never know, and so on. And these people say that, you know, it's very unlikely that it'll get out. Obviously, you can't say absolutely, and, you know, people were uh, articulating this to us. But the main thing was that Toby, Leslie, Sarah, and Gear went on to the personal media and really engaged with young people who were really, really concerned or or didn't know what it was about, and basically they said, please let us do our work, you know, please let us do our experiments. So when the people there having a picnic were allowed to have a nice picnic on Rothamsted Park, and we encouraged them to do that, they were intent themselves on using what they hoped would be a mass demonstration to break through the fence and destroy the crop. And they chose the 27th of May to do that, because that was when the crop they thought would be flowering. And you can see that we had to be totally transparent about what we did. We told them that we told the world that we used uh, a cow sequence, and so making flour with bread from wheat with a cow gene in it, pretty clear what you get. Uh, and I thought that was rather amusing. And um, the cartoon of me and the cartoon of the director was much better, in fact, much funnier. But yeah, I'm, I'm always on the same slide as the director. He doesn't like it, so we don't do that one. And the French people who came to support the, uh, the, the British opposition, they wore chef's hats, so you can tell who they are. And this is just before the Olympic Games. We had more mounted police at Rothamsted than at the Olympic Games a week or so later, but they were never deployed. We had helicopters and stuff to watch what was going on. Many of the people there are actually Rothamsted staff, just seeing who's there and so on. So we are now not faced with people necessarily eating GM in the UK, though they do via cows because we import an enormous amount of Roundup, Roundup Ready soya beans, which the EU has had to kind of let in to provide animal feed. But we do have people who want to see the experiment going forward. So that's where we are now. And that will be publicly declared because we've done all the experiments. We've done a spring, two spring sowings, an autumn sowing. We got very few aphids and very few parasitoids, which is typical of working on pests in the north. Uh, and, and that is certainly an advantage of working in Africa. But we're beginning to try the experiment of using tools which we've got from nature to try and improve uh, biological conservation control. We've also got the sex pheromone. We identified it then on St. Valentine's Day, a great popular uh, acclaim. Uh, further down the antenna is where the male aphid detects the pheromone, and that's what attracts those seven males to the female. And we know what it is from our work, and it's these compounds, and you can see working down from the high impact publication to lower and lower until we get to there where we move into synthetic biology, which is another story which I've not got time to talk about. But nonetheless, this is what we see as another pheromone target. We can also, having developed an industrial production uh, by growing Nepeta cataria as an industrial crop, we can make the Nepeta lactone there, which is one component of the pheromone of the aphids, we can make it into some other compounds which have a dramatic effect on attracting another group of beneficial insects, the, the chrysopids, the chrysopidae, the lacewings. These are predators of aphids. This was not even known to be in the UK fauna at the time, but we, we fished it out in Buckinghamshire with our attractant chemistry. And in the Far East, there are commercial uh, versions of these um, pheromone compounds from aphids that act as chiromones then in managing uh, beneficial uh, chrysopids to the extent that you've got a stamp there in China. Now, uh, colleagues at the John Innes Institute and Sarah Connor's group, um, they've shown that in plants, the production of these compounds follows this particular route. And this is different from what's in the textbooks. And we've had some difficulties in the bioinformatics program that we have led by um, Jing Zhang Zhu uh, at Rothamsted, uh, where we were part of the consortium that did the full genomic sequence of the PA for the Cyphocyphon Pisum uh, in finding, now we've got a new program with extremely bright PhD students is in Partridge, uh, and uh, we know what the pheromone of the PA for is. Again, we've got a little bit of sorting there with a high amplitude cell, this time um, giving us the response to the lactol with a particular stereochemistry shown, and then the Nepeta lactone with a particular chem stereochemistry with a low amplitude cell. And they are co-located in that uh, rhinarium further down the antenna on the third segment 
and, and, and now we're using, with the full genomic sequence, a bioinformatics approach and uh, isotope labeling study to get the genes for the next uh, job in that respect. Some people say, though, you know, aren't you pushing your luck a bit by trying to get a pheromone in a plant? And maybe I've let the fact that I kind of would like to get the plant to release the pheromone for me, maybe I've let that eclipse the fact that this is a kind of tall order to really get it expressed in the right way uh, as that Solanum bethaltii plant, but did, but as the aphid did, and now with the sex pheromone in another way where the pheromone is released by the females from her hind legs. Wouldn't it be better to use stress chemistry that the plant generates itself? And that's indeed another part of the program. So we here, Jim Tomlinson at, um, at Penn State and Marcel Dicker I've mentioned and various people around the world have got projects where we're looking at stress chemistry from plants. So when the plant is attacked, it produces chemicals that make it look and smell like not a host. So it drives away the herbivore and of course uh, if it's stress of herbivory, then it makes the parasitoids come in. So another potential tool here, and we have two compounds that uh, we and um, <coughs> various people in the U.S. are working on. Um, uh, Dorothea Toll's group there, Lee et al., and then others above that on the genetics of, which makes from the higher isoprenoid homologue a lower molecular weight isoprenoid. So where N is 1, then you've got s 11 carbon atoms. And if you go to the precursor, there's 15 there. It's a sesquiterpene. It cuts off four carbons and makes this very, very unstable compound. It looks like eb defilenazine, but it's not. It's got that really unstable structure, even worse than... Uh, and we have two grants now to find the genetics for that in the diversity being investigated by next generation sequencing in China. And then uh, the second grant is to put it into rice against Nala pavata lugans, the brown plant hopper. And that's now. We're doing all this work. We've got some evidence of the uh, aphid alarm pheromone actually working. Uh, what about this and what about the sex pheromone? We don't have really good evidence except for that first slide from Wolf Powell. But we do now have the opportunity to see this semiochemistry really working very, very well in, in Africa. And the target is to control the moths, which are called generically stem borers, but involve two families, the pyralidae and the noctuidae. And they <coughs> lay their eggs on cereal crops, particularly in smallholder farming in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, the larvae rasp away at the leaves, and then they enter the stem. That's why they're called stem bor borers or stalk borers, and knock the whole crop over. And they can cause tremendous damage. And indeed, that lady will lose her crop pretty well. Now, we have a funding agency like you do. Um, ours is called uh, DFID, Department for um, International Development. And they weren't really interested in novel science. They're really more interested in technology transfer for stuff that we already know. But most of that is not sustainable. Continual seasonal purchases of insecticides, seasonal purchases and application of fertilizers from the Harbour Bosch process, and even seasonal purchase of seed is not technically uh, and by definition sustainable. And so we were approached by this smaller charity based on the profits from the Sainsbury's supermarket chain and the vision of Lord Sainsbury himself of doing some good in the world with advice, scientific advice, from the then director of the John Innes Institute, sister institute to Roth and said, now one of the directors of Ceres over here. And they came to Roth and said, have you got any clever science that could help farmers in Africa? So we said, yes, uh, we have. It will be a means of delivering this kind of semiochemistry with companion plants to effect conservation biology. But we stipulated that we must work with the International Centre of Insect Physiology and Ecology that I mentioned earlier, because I'd already been working with them on um, the first mosquito pheromone that I identified. It's a, an oviposition pheromone. Uh, and we identified it and did all the field work with people there. And I was very, very disappointed to find that we could not commercialise it or develop it in the region, because the people who it was going to benefit by controlling filariasis and what you now know here as West Nile virus, um, were very poor people and didn't buy anything. And that taught me that you had to work in a different way there. And it seemed to me that ICP could do that. They could engage with poor people and local 
um, organizations for technology transfer. So we set up a collaboration then with Thomas Odiambo, the director and founder of ICP, and a guy he'd just recruited from the International Rice Research Institute in, in the Philippines um, to work on a push-pull. Originally they were going to work on habitat management, but we had already started to work on a concept introduced by Jim Miller at Michigan State, uh, which was the stimulo deterrent diversionary strategy or the push-pull. And you won't necessarily follow what I'm saying, don't worry, or it will be, will be made clear, I hope. So the entry point was the fact that the farmers themselves grow crops in mixture, not a monoculture like a, an industrial farmer would normally grow. In fact, in Kiswahili, which is a very typically poetic African language, it's called Kalimo Chama Changanyiko, which is growing agricultural plants with companions and m mixed agriculture, basically. So you've got maize growing there, something that a maize farmer around here would not even look at. It would be a bunch of weeds as far as he was concerned. But they are open pollinated varieties that withstand some of the problems of the region, like not enough water, no fertilizer, and lots of pests. But still they can get hammered by the stem borers. And in between you've got an intercrop of some tomatoes, but mainly Fasciolus beans. So we then said to the Gatsby Charter Fund, OK, well, we'll have a go at doing this there, because we were already trying to do it uh, in oilseed rape and some other northern crops I in the UK. But they didn't want us to do any deep science initially. They wanted us to get the push-pull plants immediately. Uh, well, that's quite kind of difficult from a standing start, but we had discussions with Thomas and, uh, and so on, and that led to a triplicated plot of all the grasses, particularly forage grasses, that were in the region. And out of that, we selected unattractive plants and highly attractive plants. And the unattractive plants then were destined to be the trap crop. Um, I think I've lost the mouse. There we go. So there's the trap crop. It's got broad leaves here because eventually we moved to a legume, as you'll see. And then the trap crop, which is the highly attractive crop on the outside. And of course, if we can get our hypothesis that some chemicals that repel herbivores will also attract beneficial insects, then we can actually attract the natural enemies as well as repelling the moths. Initially, we used Melanis minutiflora, which I introduced initially, but then we moved over in some regions to Desmodium uncinatum and then other Desmodium species. It's a one-to-one -one, uh, intercropping with the latter, and it's a one-to-four of maize with Melanis minutiflora. They're really very good at controlling the insects, but then we had a surprise discovery for the Desmodium. By the time we were on farm with that, which took us two years, during which we gradually moved through just the pull and then to the full push-pull, we were allowed to start on the science that underpins this, and so we used the electrophysiology again, and I'm going to fast forward to the Melanis minutiflora. So we can already, you can take as red, that we've already found the very attractive compounds that are responsible for the high attractiveness of the trap crop. This is a grass, it's got those compounds in it, but our hypothesis was that it also had chemicals which would cause the repellency of the moths. And indeed, when we did the electrophysiology, we got some quite minor peaks in there, um, and in fact, some no peaks at all, which give um, electrophysiological responses. I'll leave you to find them yourself. You can see that you've got more or less baseline for some electrophysiological responses and some big peaks with no electrophysiology. So some are attractants and some are opponents. We'd already ad identified the attractants, so um, we now found that we were not only then attracting, uh, uh, repelling the moths, but we were also attracting in, as our hypothesis suggested we could, um, uh, Catesia species of larval parasitoids. We were also getting in some trichogramma um, uh, egg parasitoids. And the top right-hand compound is N equals 1 from that um, synthesis, um, natural synthesis, biosynthesis that I showed before. So that m uh, DMNT is N equals 1, and so we realized why we were already getting this push-pull to work, because we got the Melanis minutiflora making something that attracted moths, uh, repelled moths, rather, but attracted the beneficial uh, insects to attack them because it smells like a damaged maize plant, and the other compounds add to that. And then more recently, we found that although 
the maize plant that we were working on usually was a hybrid because it was easy to handle. When we move to land races that are the precursors of the open pollinated varieties, the farmers saved seed, and indeed the open pollinated varieties, we then got a very early effect in stimulating defense from the maize plant. So when the eggs are laid, so there's no damage, the eggs are laid on the plant, and um, uh, not like Jim Tumlinson's elicitors from caterpillars where the caterpillar has to munch on the plant or where the aphid from us has to feed. It just the eggs don't require any damage. The plant immediately starts to recruit egg parasitoids and also larval parasitoids. And that's um, a picture from that um, ecology letter uh, paper showing both the N equals 1 and now the N equals 2 TMTT, the higher homologue C5 up. So it's now got 16 carbons. So in the eggs, no eggs, nothing there. In when you've got the eggs on the leaf, then you get the two peaks coming up, C and I, and it's also systemically. So there is a signal from the eggs that creates a systemic defense signal within the plant. What a great advantage to have. And that advantage has really been nurtured by ladies like this who's hiding there behind her husband who's nothing to do with the farming there but li likes to have his picture taken and who has been nurturing that in open pollinated varieties. And that variety she's got, that's why I particularly wanted her even though the husband comes along with her, is called Nya Muller and it's, it's an open pollinated variety gathered from seed but it's actually being produced by a small seed company in the region so it, it, it can actually be available commercially. And then with funding agents along the bottom, including our own and uh, Bill and Melinda Gates, and the Indian government, which is part of a larger consortium of funding, um, together with Ed Buckler there, you may recognise in the maize geneticist from Cornell, and Damaris Odeny, uh, who's from Icrasat, working on sorghum. We are chasing the genetics for uh, the ability to respond to the egg elicitors. And that's a paper that's just been accepted. Uh, with the uh, first author from um, uh, one of our African colleagues, and I'm not quite sure she can see it, but they're all Tiacintes, so we've gone back further now than the land races. We've gone back to the ancestors of, of maize, and um, we've got then, uh, for most of them, an increase in um, Trichogramma bornei, the egg uh, parasitoid, and Cartesia sasamii, the larval parasitoid, uh, in, a, in attraction. Um, when we've got the eggs and then the second one is without eggs and then the other one is just a, a, con a control. Um, and we've followed that through on the electrophysiology and in fact <coughs> there's a nice example there of a nice physiological response for L, peak L, you see nothing on the baseline and that's in fact where the TMTT comes and we'll probably find ions for that buried in the noise of the, of the mass, mass spec there. Um, so uh, Daniel... Uh, uh, Muti Ambe, he's very pleased with his, uh, one of his papers for his PhD. He'll have three papers for his PhD. And he's registered in Africa, but we help supervise. So it's capacity building right down to the, 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 the students. Uh, but while we're doing that genetics on the plant, we also have the job of identifying what's underneath that egg raft there. That's the glue that holds it on the plant. It's, it's a benign material, and, but it has to go into the plant. The plant has to recognize it to mount this this defense and we've just got several of the compounds that we think are active by bioassay guided fractionation out in Africa and, uh, and, uh, and Samuel Tamiru who's a PhD student um, originally from Ethiopia he's now a postdoc on this project and so he will be uh, on the publication of this compound and he will be part of the patent which we hope will allow us to fast track into the genetics by NGS RNA seq because we can now use the egg elicitor to make the transcriptome that we can then analyze by that uh, technology very, very quickly, and we almost know what the genes are anyway. Um, and that will then allow further IP to be created, which will be owned in Africa. And if we can sell it northwards for uh, the big maize breeders to rejuvenate their hybrids that don't do any of this, that's all been lost in the bottleneck that creates the hybrid plants, uh, they will have hybrid vigor and this further ability to stack in with BT because some of these moths are not controlled by BT endotoxins that are available currently and the 
products should also control other insects which often resurge in. And this work is going forward now with a new development, which I'm very, very proud of, because I've just stood down as the chair of the governing council at ECP. You might think I'm conflicted. Well, maybe, but anyway, I've done a good job. I brought DFID core funding there. But my final act was to recruit with the governing council a new director general. So we had uh, Thomas Odiambo, who's um, a lower-speaking Kenyan. Uh, we then had Hans Herren, who's a Swiss um, World Food Prize winner. We then had Christian Burgermeister, and you'll notice these are all European people. Uh, now we have a woman with a superb CV, and she's from Ethiopia, where she grew up on a farm. So Segenet Kalimo is the new boss there, and it's with her that we'll be doing the uh, NGS RNA seek work. Now, so far, we've been working on a constitutive expression of whatever we want. That is the semiochemicals that give us the, the, uh, the biological control and the uh, expression of the genes. Now, what we really need is some way of switching on this genetics that relates to damage. And we're already going to get more of that uh, with the agar listers. But we have a compound. It's that compound there, cis-jasmone. And that imitates plant damage so that when it comes onto an intact plant, it switches on the defense in there. And that, of course, has promoter sequences that allow that to happen. This is in Arabidopsis in front of luciferase or gus. And we have the same promoters now for cis-jasmone in wheat. So, of course, the next step in the GM wheat saga is to have the switchable genes now, plastidial expressed and all that, but only going on when we know they're there. And we also have the prospect, a little bit further away, of having elicitors related to aphid damage. Even in the wild-type plants, though, not made to respond particularly to cisjasmone, you can get an upregulation of the genetics that makes particularly N equals 2. And that's what we've got there. And the, mo the wasp is responding. That's the wasp that lays its eggs in the aphid. So uh, it's responding. It's a bit of a messy trace because the wasps are really very small to get your electrodes into a single olfactory neuron. Very difficult, but nonetheless, it's possible. And that is responsible for various effects in major crops. And working with Syngenta, and I can only say that here, it's a secret in Europe, but here everybody knows that we've just completed a very expensive series of field trials on world crops using cisjasmone to induce defense against the non-BT targeted insects like Aphis cassipii there uh, with Brazilian collaborators and Indian collaborators where it induces T, um, uh, TT, the N equals 2, and caryophyllene, not a problem in this context. The cisjasmone's gone, that's not traceable, uh, but the plant lives on with the effect. In uh, soya bean, our friend in, uh, in, in Brazil, uh, not a problem with Lepidopterus insects, so BT is not much use. But against stink bugs, we can induce um, TMTT and DMNT, N equals 1 and 2, uh, to attract in uh, egg parasitoids of the stink bugs, and that's with Embrapa. And under glass in Britain with Sarah Dewhurst, whose picture we saw a little while ago, we can uh, manage uh, commercially available parasitoids uh, with uh, the same kind of technology on, uh, on protected crops. We can also get a priming effect in maize. This is with Nigerian colleagues, so Sunday Olive Wefami from the um, uh, Bowen University in, um, in Iwo uh, has shown that if you treat the plant with cisjasmone, then there's a heightened response against the uh, leaf hopper or the plant hopper when it comes in. That's a vector of maize streak virus. Finally, if I may, chairs, uh, carry on a little bit longer. Um, I just want to round up with a few uh, ideas of diversification from the original work on insects. You see men now, mostly the women are the farmers, but there's animal husbandry here, and we have um, pressure from them to have a legume into crop, so we replaced, for some regions, the Melanis minutiflora, as I said, with, with Desmodium uncinatum, that's what it looks like. And that's brought in support from Heifer International from the US and from Sender Cow from the UK because of the added value uh, that the legume provides for animal husbandry. And they give a heifer uh, to the farmer that can demonstrate forage 
and have a corral for zero grazing and uh, they give back the firstborn calf and that is a great system with some really great people that we work with from there. And by chance, purely by chance, though we probably wouldn't have noticed had not we didn't been doing the experimental work as well, it controls Striga hermonthica, the African witchweed. And that lady is really going to lose her crop. She farms a small farm, uh, about an acre, uh, with some more kids than those, grandparents, no husband, very, very harsh life, and needs to be self-sufficient. And against stem borers and Striga, has a really bad time. That's the striga attached to the plant where it does most of the damage before it comes out. And from the desmodium we found some totally different chemistry that enters the rhizosphere which involves particular compounds that have C-linked glycosides. So there's a glucose and an arabinose joined through carbon onto uh, a pigeonin but it has to go through a rather convoluted route to get there which we've understood uh, again by bioassay guided fractionation to the extent that we can pinch a couple of genes from rice uh, which were isolated by Rob Edwards at Durham University, a colleague of ours and so we put those together with Mike Timker at Virginia University into cowpea and we've got the first glycosylated product but we still have to get that arabinose in but we're hoping that we can get that out of Desmodium over the next time. Now this works as well with other cereals Sorghum is indigenous to Africa, so it's quite tolerant of Striga, but it gives a lower yield. With an intercrop of another species of Desmodium, we can get double or triple the yield on pearl millet, which is slightly tolerant. Uh, we do the same, and we get a massive increase in yield with finger millet published there, which is really hammered by. Uh, with rice, which is grown as a non-irrigated crop in smallholder farms, particularly in Uganda, again hammered by... Um, uh, Striga hermonthica, we can get a double yield in the first season. It's a suicidal germination that we get, and so we lose the seed from the seed bank. And the seed bank can remain viable for 20 years, so that's a real accomplishment in that time to lose viable seed from the farm where the push pull is going on. So, besides controlling stem borers and striga, we've got animal husbandry, we've got soil nutrition, we've got um, edges against erosion with the perimeter crop and various things there that are referenced in the beginnings of the socio-economic studies. We've had some problems, stem borers controlled but um, leaf hoppers transmitting a phytoplasma stunt disease into one of the trap crops and that's Mr. Auma and on his farm we found some resistant stock now that we've identified um, uh, Midas banda or Acilia banda as the vector and so we called that first uh, variety of napier grass after Uma, so it's Uma too actually. Um, uh, we have GPS references for all the farms, so uh, people who don't really believe that it's as good as I'm telling you can go out there and see for themselves with only the GPS. They don't have us interfering with who they talk to and so on. And this very sceptical Swiss man, Martin Fischler, is now a great convert to this and brings in money. And finally, we've got a new grant on top of an older grant from the European Union to try and produce push-pull plants that will deal with, with drought and that we've done um, and we've come initially to a species of Brachiaria made into a hybrid that is apomictic so it, it seed doesn't segregate uh, so you can grow it from seed as well as vegetatively so it's an African genus but developed in South America uh, to replace the trap crop very avidly uh, et by cattle and dairy goats, and then Desmodium untortum replacing uh, the um, Desmodium uncinatum, and that's what it looks like, with the sorghum now replacing the maize as a more drought-tolerant crop. Uh, the brachiaria has been harvested there. And there's some unpublished uh, numbers there, so in sorghum, 100% striga control, 70% uh, insect control, and those spectacular yield changes on really very, very bad land. And that's why the, the, the controls are so bad. The monoculture maize is just so bad. So we've got a massive increase in, in, in yield there, which is really more spectacular than we normally get. And don't forget, that's from fewer maize plants, because when we have the trap crop, we lose a bit of land. We don't alter the spacing for the intercrop. So um, that's in Western Kenya, in East Africa, 
where we've got this take up. Now going a bit faster as we've got the European Union money. But now in the new program, we have the charge of going out to a million farmers in the next two or three years, which I imagine we'll manage. And if you want to have these um, references, the ones by Alice Miraja are the socioeconomic ones. Lots of technologies to try and transfer into farming communities, but farmer field days are really quite the best. Uh, new science is emerging. You've gathered that. We've got a, still a problem of seed availability for the Desmodium species. Uh, we'd like more funding from other agencies to help with that. And really, we're still working on how we transfer the, the, the information to, to smallholders, which is very knowledge intense and so brings some problems. I think we'll miss the rhizosphere. And we'll finish with the over-the-horizon ideas of sentinel plants generally. So with all this signalling, now in the rhizosphere, I was going to say, but terrestrially, aerially as well, if you can have a sentinel plant that's susceptible to the problem, or even picks up an opportunity, it could signal to the main crop, and that could switch on genes which allow it to either accept the opportunity or deal with the problem. And that's a generic issue which we're testing with Embrapa, Salvador Lima, PhD student on the project, wonderful guy, against Phacopsera pachyrhizae, the soya bean uh, rust, which could wipe out global soya production. It develops very, very fast. But we can already see changes in the secondary metabolites before you can pick up genetic diagnostics for the development of the pathogen. So the plant detects it, and we can detect the chemicals, which means we could link that to a visual marker and eventually to a mark to uh, a signal which switches on new genetically based resistance to this uh, disease that are being developed by Jonathan Jones, our collaborator at the John uh, the Sainsbury Laboratory. We've also turned our attention to methane from cows and nitrous oxide from fertilizer, and magically. The Brachiaria genus that we're now using in the new program is able to produce chemistry in some sub-Saharan savanna wetland species that interferes with nitrous oxide production. That's a Harbour Bosch process catalyst tower from Frankfurt. That's what we subsidise agriculture with at the moment. We've got to replace that, but in the meantime, we think we can use plant allelopathy in this way to interfere with the mineralization and the production of nitrous oxide, which is a very, very powerful greenhouse gas that we in agriculture are largely responsible for. And it also introduces the idea of perennialization, which goes on very nicely at Washington Pullman and in the Kunming Institute in China. And there's the first perennial upland rice grass, uh, uh, rice uh, which would normally be totally pink with uh, Striga being protected by a Desmodium species in, in Uganda where it's a popular crop. Lots of colleagues, but they're the main ones. Jonathan, senior plant molecular biologist. Zia Khan, leader of the African work. Jimmy Pitcher, social science. Charles Midega, uh, another biologist. Uh, Hugh did all the um, transgenic work. Mike and Tony at the end, uh, chemists like me. Toby, the biologist. Michaela did the cisjasmo molecular work, Jing Zhang Zhu, you saw his new job, and Christine on the end there did the, um, did the work on the electrophysiology. Thank you. Um, f first, I want to thank you again. Um, we spent most of yesterday together, um, and just an incredible scientific story that you tell. It's really, really fascinating. Um, I'm going to resist the temptation to go really, really deep into the science here and s focus on some bigger relationships. The first one is um, this idea of uh, potential synergies between um, very much an ecological approach, as you demonstrated in Africa, and, and more of a technological approach, um, the example being genetically modified crops that you demonstrated in, in, uh, in Britain. And so I can see the synergy between the science in those two situations, because it's about signaling and what happens. And I'm, what I'm wondering, though, is what's this, what other ways might they be just synergistic? For example, within the push-pull system, what might be potential roles for 
genetically modified crops in those systems, given all of the constraints that those farmers face? Yeah, we've, uh, we have a great opportunity to discuss with farmers because we have these things called barazas, which is a sort of party. Uh, and at those barazas, you, you, you discuss with um, the farmers. They may make a drama about the work they're doing. There'll be people from the ministry, funding agencies, and so on. It's quite a quite a quite a, 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 an event, and so you can say, well, you know, what what are your problems? And um, sometimes um, the largely women workforce will say, well, it's hard work going out there, you know, with a hoe, with a mattock. It's it's called a djembe. It's a heavy mattock to cut the um, line for the maize seeds to go into or the sorghum seeds in the mat of perennially growing desmodium. Uh, we'd like to get the bullock in there, but you know it, it's a bit awkward because you've got the trap crop around the outside. So we can just discuss things like that, and then we can say, well, you know, in the long term, how do you see the farm going? They say, well, you know, we have nowhere to go really, so we we see ourselves being here, but we would like to have a less backbreaking job to pass on to the kids. So you say, well, what about um, um, uh, us using? genetic modification and then you have a discussion about what that is mm -hmm. uh, though there's quite a high level of literacy in some of the farmers they may have actually been educated quite well but n just not been able to get off the farm um, and uh, and then we say well you know you like to grow beans there we've had to restrict your bean growing because we need one-to-one -one desmodium to control a striger and so on uh, what about an edible bean that would control Stryger, and that's an entry point which is a realistic prospect because you could see with Mike Timko we're gradually working through the genes that we need to add to cowpea to uh, allow it to make those glycoside um, pigeonin kind of compounds uh, from its own uh, natural production. So you'd use that to replace the desmodium yep. and that function? Yeah, so okay. you'd then have an edible bean, you'd have some leguminous leaf forage for the goats or the cows, mm -hmm. not as good previous desmodium, but you'd have the human uh, opportunity there, and you'd have the control of the striger yep. at the same time. Uh, and, um, and so this is greeted with a very pragmatic mm -hmm. view, which is, well, it sounds good, you know, if it doesn't kill the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the family, then, you know, we'll, <laughs> we'll go for it, <laughs> kind of thing. And when and they say that, they probably are referring to, you know, the residual stories of the early use of, because uh, when, uh, when DDT was found to be accumulating in the environment, we in the north said you can't use it anymore, you see, because it wasn't probably causing Armageddon out there as it might be doing here with, with, uh, with raptors and so on, because it doesn't last very long. But we, we then replaced it, of course, with organophosphorus compounds, which, you know, unlike DDT, which you, in fact, even Dieldrin, which is actually quite poisonous. We have an old guy in England called Buzzvine, and he's, he's even older than me, he's 98 or something, and he, he used to eat a threepenny bit, you know, a small coin dipped in dieldrin, and he would eat this, you know, it was about a tenth of the toxic dose, but, you know, it either <laughs> kills you or it doesn't, so he must have tons of this in his adipose tissue, but they did <laughs> move to OPs, which are dangerous, yeah. so you've got to be careful yeah. with those. Is so, uh, can I just clarify, though, I, is that the, rea is it, um, that openness to looking at those traits, is that the reaction of the farmers or is that the reaction of people from the ministries in, in the governance of um, No, no, that, that was just farmers really. Okay. That was really me sort of saying, you know, let's hear so, from So let's that, hear from that, that farmers, where it would yeah. be implemented, they're open yeah, to it. Yeah. But, but what about um, uh, Well, government that's officials? a different k kettle of fish there, of course. So. Yeah. And, and I mean, there are all kinds of political nuances to this. And, um, you know, one is that, well, if there are people in Europe who don't like this idea, then, you know, why should we do it? Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I'm on the DFID Scientific Advisory Board, and we've been to Brussels to see the European Union, and we've said, you know, you create an example which implies there's a problem here, which there might be, but we don't have any evidence in our view for it, but you're frightening people where it might help them a great deal one day. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's, a, it's a different situation, I think, in terms of the U.S., because the U.S. is seen to be eating, uh, uh, and uh, as, uh, as it said in the flyer for this, 80% mm -hmm. of your food might be GM, whereas in 
in Europe, it, none of it might be, mm -hmm. except the meat that's been fed on Roundup mm -hmm. Ready soya. But the, the, the officials are by and large fairly positive, and um, Museveni, the Prime Minister of Uganda, although sometimes you get muscle flexing from his ministers, he himself is actually quite interested mm -hmm. in this. And, and William Ruto, who's the deputy president in Nigeria to Uhuru Kenyatta, who is the president, uh, he is actually very interested in this kind of technology and sees it as a way of helping smallholder farmers. He's kind of missed out the process, which is, you know, what, what, what can we get and what can we deliver? Mm -hmm. uh, he already wants to do it now. Yep. But he's a very unusual politician. He's doing a PhD in, um, in, uh, in, in antelopes that live in aquatic environments, which is pretty unusual. <laughs> he was also, if you remember, supposed to be go to the, uh, the, the, the Hague Court of uh, uh, Criminal Court mm -hmm. uh, over his activities during the election before last, but that's no longer going ahead. So yeah. my picture of me shaking hands with him I can actually have on the wall <laughs> now, but I, I don't support the kind mm -hmm. of activity right. that went on there. That's not the point, but you know, I'm just kind of saying there is political support and there is opportunistic political not support. Yep. And in Zaire, of course, they've refused um, uh, maize aid from the U.S. because it right. might contain yep. GM maize. So one last question about that. Could, could, could you implement the strategy you just talked about where maybe you're using a bean instead so that it provides protein for the household? Could you implement that and not have that become the input that they have to buy? Can they just save that and grow it year after year? Well, I, I keep telling people like Diffid and Bill and Melinda Gates and Rockefeller and so on that it would be better to admit defeat on this hybrid business because it is not being used. You know, they, they're, they're convinced that it should be. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's fine, you know, but it's been available for a very long time and all kinds of ways have been sought to deliver it which just don't embed. Uh, you certainly need to have a lot of fertilizer if you're going to grow hybrids. And many of these hybrids are not really adapted to the region. The ones that are are <laughs> more like the OPs anyway. Mm -hmm. So you might as well admit defeat and put the research into developing seed transmissible traits. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the local seed industry does a bit of that. They actually steal stuff, you know, they, they get a bit of uh, uh, maize street resistance from some commercial outfit mm -hmm. and then they grow it into their seed and so you've got now an OPV with maize street resistance mm -hmm. in it which you can trace back to Simit in, in fact you know yeah. and they don't pay any royalties on it or anything but maybe that's what we should kind of regularize mm -hmm. you know because banging your head against this wall of hybrid vigor is not really working I think you know we should get on with it and if you put hybrids out there unless you've got irrigation and, and that's got much worse with climate change mm -hmm. and the erratic weather conditions put it out there without water and without extra fertilizer, you might as well not buy it. Mm -hmm. a, a question that came up yesterday in one of our discussions, but it came up in a very, just a very brief way, kind of looking at the other side of this coin now is we have these very industrialized systems that are in place, s certainly in m most of U.S. agriculture, but also the agriculture in Europe, highly industrialized. But this concept of push-pull is really, really fascinating. And, and can we envision ways where our uh, cropping systems don't rely just on the technology, but they may, we may be able to implement aspects of push-pull in whether it's soybean production in Brazil or corn production in Iowa? Well, we need certainly a, a market pull on this, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, I mean, I talk to farmers a lot. I'm actually in a, a farmers association. They're called the grasshoppers. And um, they open their meeting with a hunting horn. It's really quite amusing. Um, <laughs> and uh, and th they, of course, think I'm partly mad. But on the other hand, they're very interested in what agriculture is going to look like in the longer term future. And they know it's not going to be the same as it is now. And they're very progressive people. They really want to do something there uh, in their own interests, of course. But uh, mm -hmm. it fits in kind of with our general interests of sustainable food supply. And um, uh, But at the moment, they, they've got... They've got pesticides and it, it's getting more expensive because every time we get a new one I mean Europe's put a lid on really registration of neonicotinoids in Europe they will not be re-registered mm -hmm. basically uh, I mean Europe is a niche anyway for agriculture 
and, 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 and so, you know, if they're going to make it awkward, then the companies will leave. And BSF is now in Triangle Park in, um, in Carolina here. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, certainly the biotech division, anyway. And, and so um, we can actually run out of registered pesticides in Europe mm -hmm. and have to do something else. You can even have a referendum mm -hmm. where they banned it tomorrow because Germany is that mad at the moment. I, you can't imagine how a technologically oriented country has let itself be lured into unreal ideas about what you can do currently with agriculture. Uh, so um, we could be faced with having to do more, mm -hmm. but the real driver is going to be nitrogen. Mm -hmm. And you know whether my friend Giles Oldroyd at the John Innes is going to score with bacteria that live in the in the plant and fix nitrogen for it, or whether people are going to get better catalysts to have a, a farmyard gate harbour Bosch, which I very, very much doubt, mm -hmm. um, or whether you're going to fix nitrogen biochemically and have that in your maize roots or whatever. But certainly we may need to change the crop architecture mm -hmm. and we may have to have involvement of, of legumes. But I, I've been trying to work out a system of one plant pushing and pulling. And uh, we've done some work with antifeedants. So antifeedants are a problem in that the plant grows through the antifeedant and then gets hammered. So obviously a GM antifeedant in the plant would be one way. But another way would actually be to have a slow-acting, non-neurotoxic, but more specific insecticide. Uh, so you'd protect the growing part of the plant, the plant that's going to produce the seed with the antifeedant, while the slow-acting insect growth regulator or something kills. And we've done that, in fact, in, in what you call canola, in oilseed rape. So we, we've tried that, and we have it there, but there's nobody going to market it because it's very expensive because you've got two things to buy. Right. And antifeedant production is not industrial at the moment. Yep. Great. So, so I'll ask you this question while you're answering, if we can get some of the questions that come up out of the room passed up. I'll ask them, or ask as many as I can. Um, so the, the, the work that you described at Rothenstead, um, is there something unique about that implementation of GM that makes it more a more durable solution than the way that we've already implemented it, for example, for BT? No, I think whatever you do that works well will be resisted. I think, you know, if you put a strong selection pressure onto an insect. So regardless of my not being able to tell you about the field results, if we get this alarm pheromone GM to work on a big scale, then the aphids will be faced with developing or being selected against responding to e-beta farnesine. It's probably unlikely that they will be able to not respond to an alarm pheromone and get away with it because they will be more heavily predated or parasitized then. So they will then start to use minor components of what's in the alarm pheromone. This is, we've already seen this from uh, Joachim Ruter's work and, and some other workers in, um, in, in Cornell University where you've got genetic drift in the composition of pheromones. And what happens is that you move away from the main compound, and this is even without selection pressure, it's just drift, um, to minor components. And the biosynthesis creeps up, and the response at the olfactory neuron level creeps up. And so that's what we kind of predict. So I've actually taken a kilogram of aphids, because the peak from E. beta farnesine goes way out the top of the building. And there you've got this really minute peak, and it's EE alpha farnesine. And that is the smell of greasy apples, Granny Smith apples. And I've got the gene, as I said the other day, <laughs> in my back pocket. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm ready for the aphids resisting that particular compound. And I can stay ahead with electrophysiology. I can keep monitoring what the aphid's doing or Christine can with the electrophysiology, or whoever's going to do it can. And so we don't have to build a new toxifor. I mean, I'm chairman of a Bill and Melinda Gates committee that's making new mosquito agents for malaria control, because we've got vast resistance against permethrin, which was invented by my predecessor, Michael Elliott, at Rothamsted. And we will have three new aphicides, uh, uh, three new insecticides against mosquitoes over the next few years. One probably announced this year from major chemical companies help do this by funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Fund. It's a great strategy. And uh, we can predict how many compounds have to be made and how much money we have to spend. We know the bottom line to get this, and, and that will happen. But we're going to put them out then in bed nets and so on, in the beautiful 
best way you could possibly select for resistance. And so we're trying to work on this to try and get new paradigms of use so we don't burn these compounds down so quickly. But with the semiochemicals, since they are natural, and since they have natural genes, they're kind of there by definition. And since we've got a way of finding out what the insect can, can, can be changing its response to, then we hope we can stay up, or at least with the game. Uh, but uh, we're not doing what Monsanto did, as I was talking to Sheldon about earlier, and that when they got BT endotoxin into, into cotton, they said, you know, we're, we're never going to get resistance because we're just going to kill all the pests. What a brilliant idea. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have questions? I, I have more. So. I'm not saying that because Monsanto is an American company because ICI also said it as well, which is now Syngenta, of course. Okay. So given the, uh, the, the scientific complexity, and you gave some great examples of that, I recognized a few of those chemical symbols as they went past, but um, <laughs> the, com the, the complexity even of the development of GM crops and, and the uh, low level of understanding in the public, um, how do you uh, combat the fear-based messaging around, for example, the cow wheat uh, or yeah. the, the cow bread that you showed. Uh, people were very worried about that, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's a very good question. I mean, uh, you know, we, we have a, a very large uh, recent migrant population from the old Commonwealth. Um, uh, that includes uh, people uh, with religions that mean they don't eat cows and so on. There was all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we actually sat down with groups of, of, of Hindu um, mm -hmm. Uh, believing people, yep. and we talk to them about it. We explain and, what and it who's, was. And who's we? Is it a group of scientists? Yeah, I, 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 I have, a, I have a job description which involves a certain amount of time spent uh, engaging with mm -hmm. the public. And that doesn't mean, you know, I have to go out and talk to them. They have to ask me to talk to them. Otherwise, you're not engaging. And, and I'm very keen to do that. And I, I like doing it. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not upset by people being so worried that they, they look like they're going to punch me on the nose, but <laughs> it's a big nose. So. Does that happen? <laughs> Pardon? Does that well, happen? no, no, because I am genuinely friendly in this country. <laughs> I mean, I fight a hard corner in a scientific debate, I can tell you, but, you know, if somebody's got a worry, I, I'm, I, I was, uh, Sheldon asked me what I would do differently in my life, and I said I would be less aggressive to people who've got worries about this in the past, but mm -hmm. now I'm, you know, I'm, I'm the model of understanding in this respect. So, you know, <laughs> if somebody says, well, I really don't like to eat genes, I, I say, well, you know, you, let's try and work out what you mean, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, you know, I've been on an Ipso Mori um, uh, interaction system with people just off the street in the East End of London, and mm -hmm. there's a very low knowledge of the biology, but a lot of stuff come in from the media, and some of it's quite fact-based, and mm -hmm. some of it's just really worry. And I said to the other day, a guy looked at a a load of food and he believed that it was all GM food and his, one of his reasons was that the tomatoes were so red and you know I mean we don't really have GM tomatoes, we don't have GM tomatoes in right. Britain, we had flavour saver tomatoes but they're no Sheldon's eaten yeah. so and, <laughs> and he's perfectly normal <laughs> and, uh, and so have I, <laughs> we do look a bit similar though Sheldon, there may be a bit of a problem here <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, uh, you know he'd, he obviously got really the idea that he was being stuffed with GM food. Yep. But, um, and uh, um, so I think the main thing is, is to be sympathetic, to have an empathy. And you know, it's not entirely their fault that they don't know about this. You know, we've obviously got something problematic with the educational system in which, you know, you've got people existing by merit of the fact that they've got genes in them, not actually knowing that. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not just people who are unemployed on the streets. I can tell you, I've been at a meeting of the business community in the UK who did not know that the universe was expanding and that you could use the Doppler effect on light to show this. They had no idea of this, you know, <laughs> not a clue. And when this guy um, put an electric current through a gherkin and it exploded, um, giving this bright sodium colour from the sodium chloride in the gherkin, the pickled gherkin. 
Um, and he said that, you know, uh, if you run away from this very fast, <laughs> it changes colour. <laughs> That's how we know the universe. <laughs> it's absolute, you know, absolutely incredible. It was like, you know, the scales were cast from their eyes and suddenly yeah. all these guys <laughs> who knew how to rip off people in banking, sorry, yeah. <laughs> 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 suddenly realised that they were in an expanding so universe. Y <laughs> you raised the issue um, right toward the end of your talk about, um, about patents. Um, that that you want that identifying genes you wanted to be able to patent them, um, which I was curious about. This is a question somewhat related, but uh, let's make it specific to what you were talking about. And the question is, what's your view of being able to do that, to be able to patent and obviously make profits off of that for um, individual genes? And I guess I would add to that. Um, if you're doing that within the context of finding those genes in sub-Saharan Africa, then how do those benefits accrue back to the people who live in sub-Saharan Africa? Well, this is going to chart new territory, of course, but uh, uh, my institute uh, has signed up to various declarations uh, which all relate to freedom of access to IP for developing countries. And indeed, uh, you know, some of the country, some of the companies that are vilified in this area have actually, you know, done quite a lot of that. Uh, Ingo Petroikas's golden rice wouldn't have happened without a lot of free access to IP from big companies. Uh, and um, uh, and so we, we, you know, we know that there are various problems here, but basically it will be free access to any agency in the region, because I don't think we want to create any kind of monopolies. I mean, there aren't the companies to mm -hmm. do that or anything anyway. It's going to have to have a fairly heavy external funding component from state agencies like USAID, DFID, and so on. And um, some involvement from small companies that don't have a research arm anyway. So they're not going to pay royalties, so we wouldn't want to. But really, when it crosses the Sahara, then we want to see the royalties paid and come back mm. to the institutions in Africa that have brought this into being. And that includes, in my view, the farmers who've been looking after these OPVs. And uh, I don't know how we're going to do that. But, um, so that's the difference between our past model and our future model, is that it's not just that they get um, free uh, intellectual property they get a, some of the profits that return to them to support yeah, some kind of Yeah, they actually create it as well. You know, they're part of the yeah. vehicle that creates it. And I think that's going to be very good, you know, because, you know, y you may find some anti-American, anti-European um, attitudes there. You know, we were, we, we were running many of these countries as, as colonists. You know, there was, there, was, there was violent civil war as we defended Kenya as a colony against the Mau Mau resistance. And, you know, I, I know the sons and daughters of people who were involved in that. But, um, uh, so we've all got to live this down. But uh, I think, you know, that they are upset by being the kind of loser all the time. And to actually be proud of developing some technology like the push-pull and then some IP that Monsanto is going to pay for and put into their hybrid maze is a great prospect. Uh, I mean, whether we can bring it off, I don't know. But I, I've obviously talked to the companies and... Mm -hmm. They say, of course, you know, if, if it's good for us, we'll pay for it. You know, mm -hmm. that's what we do. Um, and they bought the patents for BT originally from uh, Belgium, from Mark van Montagu and Jeff Shell. And Mark van Montagu is still around, you know. And so we, we, we've kind of done it before. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think it would be great. And I think the companies would rather like to be seen to be doing it as mm -hmm. well. Um, and it could be good for everybody. Mm -hmm. Whether we bring it off, I don't know. You know, I mean, I'm. I'm 70 in a couple of weeks, but uh, my mum's 98, so I've got a bit of time to <laughs> see this through. <laughs> any, any changes in, uh, in quality of uh, wheat associated with the transformations or the modifications that you've done so no, far? No, I, I said there's no observable phenotype. Mm -hmm. We've had to go into very great detail to satisfy referees, mm -hmm. in fact. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, we said initially that we'll look at the phenotype from the point of view of the seed and the chlorophyll content because um, you know the prenylation that is a late step in the biosynthesis of chlorophyll involves the isoprenoidal pathway so you know we've, we've kind of done all that and we um, 
we, we don't see a phenotype. And we've looked at things that might happen, and we found mercy in this minor component that is there. It's actually there in the low expression line. So what actually happens is that the phylazine synthase runs out of phenyl diphosphate in the plastid, even though there's a good flux of it there. So he looks around for something that looks like it, and it's got geronyl diphosphate, and he makes that into mercine. When you've got the extra phenyl diphosphate from the cow gene, then you, you don't have that going on. Uh, and mercine is a benign compound. There's a lot more of it in beer than, uh, than, uh, than pharnacine, so <laughs> I'm really okay on that. <laughs> <laughs> Oh no, that's uh, that's another trait that we can easily look at. We 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 do a lot on uh, on on milling property and so on. Uh, I mean, from six meter by six meter plots, even with replicates, you don't get a lot of grain really. And um, I think the, uh, the 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 grain phenologists have been mucking around with it so much that I think you know it's pretty well used up. Except that we have to keep producing seed. We, we're very keen to do some trials with a higher parasitoid density and so I'm accumulating seed for US and for Chinese um, experimentation. Um, so we haven't done that but we can do that certainly. Uh, I mean um, we wouldn't expect, I mean there's no plastids obviously in there, we wouldn't expect uh, any of this stuff really to get there but we, we'll look at it, you know, we, we, we'll look at anything that's, that's, that's feasibly going to be changed. And don't forget you can't look at everything. You know, Avogadro's number is a very, very big number. <laughs> and with the best mass spec that Al has got here, you're only a little bit lower than halfway down. And there's stuff present at molarities lower than you can have analyzable that do things to us. They're called carcinogens, you know? And so you never want to say it's not there. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and as a scientist, you know, you never want to say it's totally safe. Mm -hmm. What we're doing is we're working on risk, plausible risk, and one day we've got to show an advantage, and that advantage has got to be appreciable not only to these farmers, but to the guy who thinks red tomatoes are GM tomatoes. It's got to be realized by people, and it's got to be realized in a world that's got to have more intense food production in a more sustainable way. So it's got a lot of things to deliver on here. And as a scientist, I have to say, some of this technology may look laughable in 10 or 20 years when we get something new. But what we're doing at the moment is we're racking up a lot of new molecular biological techniques, and we're now uh, contending with genome editing and so on. And um, it, there's so many techniques, it would be difficult to sort of brand it all as bad or good or whatever. We've got to kind of work our way through this always thinking at the end of the day what it might be worth, but knowing that we have to take some kind of risk to get there and that we will certainly have a risk when we are there. With that, we'll close. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks. Let's give John a hand. Thank you. Thanks That's again. my media soundbite coming out of there. Sorry about that. <laughs> the training kicked <laughs> <That's> in. <laughs>